Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the senator is on a tight schedule and therefore we do not want to waste any time. So if you give me your attention, we'll proceed. First, let me say that it's a pleasure and a privilege for the Department of History and Philosophy to sponsor Senator Harry Jackson's appearance at Kingsborough. Now, if you recall, we have done this two years ago when Governor Kerry was running for governor, and it is a privilege again to do the same when the senator is running as a candidate for president. And if you recall, the governor made it. I hope the senator makes it as well. I should also add that we did extend an invitation to the other candidates. They have not availed themselves yet of this opportunity, but it doesn't matter because we know that the people who do avail themselves of these opportunities succeed. So that, Senator, you're in good tradition, and we hope that by your appearing here, it will aid in your success to become a candidate for president and win the primaries. Before I introduce the, press, the Senator, Okay. <laughs> I just told the Senator that if he becomes president, I become Secretary of State. He promised that. <laughs> All right. Uh, before I introduce Senator Jackson, let me call upon the president of our college, who is not running, and, and he'll say a few words of greeting, President Goldstein. Senator Jackson, welcome to Kingsboro country. It's a pleasure to have you. This is a great day for our college. It's really the democratic process in action, where people from all walks of life can come together and join to review with you, Senator, your platform and positions on all of the domestic and national issues. And we recognize your stances on national security, on aid to our cities, and especially to the City University of New York in terms of open admissions and free tuition. We also know your positions on the Middle East and the State of Israel and the rights of all human beings in our world. Senator, Welcome to Kingsborough. We're glad to have you with us. Thank you very much, President Goldstein. And now, I was talking to the President a few minutes ago, and he was telling me his background, how he started and majored in political science, and subsequently was telling his students and his uh, followers that he made a mistake in not majoring in history. I agree with the senator, and therefore we are on the same ground all along. The senator is a distinguished man in the United States Senate. Whether he wins the presidency or not, Senator Jackson has merited our gratitude and our appreciation for the hard work he has done in the Senate. As you know, he's one of the most hard-working senators, one of the most influential senators in the United States Senate. In that sense, he's much like a scholar. He prepares his work, masters it, and then applauds it. And therefore, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Senator Henry Jackson. <laughs> How about it? Hey! Thank you, Dr. Klein, President Goldstein, members of the student body of Kingsborough College, guests and ladies and gentlemen. By the way, I like the signs out here. I don't know who that fellow Scoop is, but uh, I'm for him. I like your spirit. I like your attitude. 
I like your concern, and it's a real pleasure, Mr. President, to come to your college and to share a few thoughts with the students, members of the faculty, and guests that are here. I'm very proud that in the state of Washington, we pioneered in the development and growth of community colleges in a small state like the state of Washington, I want to report to you that in our two-year colleges, we call them, first they were called junior colleges, then they were called community colleges. We have over 100,000 students in the state of Washington with a little over 3 million people, and I'm proud of that record. <clears throat> I just want to see a better job done for all of America, including New York City. The overriding issue facing this nation is not complicated. It's jobs, J-O-B-S. Putting America back to work again will be the number one priority of a Jackson administration. And no one understands it more effectively and more realistically than the young people between 18 and 25 were in some of our large metropolitan areas as high as 75 percent of our young people are out of work. And we're not going to tolerate that for one moment in a Jackson administration. Let me tell you what we're going to do about it. We're going to launch to get the economy moving, to get the revenues that we need that we've lost and we're losing over $150 billion in revenue. That's why colleges, that's why cities, that's why counties, that's why the states, Speaking of those entities alone are in trouble today because people are out of work and when you're out of work you can't pay taxes and without revenue we can't have a good school system, we can't have a healthy city and we can't have in short the kind of environment that we want for our people. And I will start on a 20 billion dollar public works program to build schools, to build hospitals, to build and to develop our water quality treatment plants were $60 billion behind in that area alone. Rebuild the railroad bids. Build the mass and rapid transit systems that we need. What I want America to do is to invest in the future. I think our people want payroll checks and not handout checks. That's what they want. It costs $75 billion a year to support people out of work. Isn't it better that we take some of that money and start investing it in America, whether it's in this college or whether it's in a hospital, you name it, the list is long. But we shouldn't wait for one moment to put our people to work in wealth-producing undertakings. And by the way, when we do these things, we're also going to do something else. I've introduced legislation for a Civilian Conservation and Environmental Corps that will make it possible for our young people between 18 and 25 to work in our national parks and our forests, in our great recreation areas, both in the federal level and the state level, and to get the kind of training and education so they can then go out into the private sector and be qualified for employment and jobs. And that is the kind of effort that must be made. I'm the author of the Youth Conservation Corps that makes it possible for young people between 15 and 18 during the summer months, June, July, and August, to work in our parks and our forests and learn a little bit about the environment, which is so important. We want a good environment, and I'm the author of the National Environmental Policy Act. 
And I want to say that I am opposed to the landing of the so-called SST at JFK. I say that because the amount of noise pollution, the short time that it has, what we call loiter time, 28 minutes, makes JFK an impractical place for any such thing. And we need to know more about the problems inherent in that particular activity than we have today. And the alternate route at Dulles is the proper course but not at a place where we have the highest traffic, the greatest population congestion in the entire United States right in this area. That is no place for the Concord to utilize the facilities of JFK. My friends, not only do I want to see this emergency program get underway, but I have a long-range program in the area of energy which will take many years, and we're going to literally have to invest, I don't say spend, in the next 15 years, $2 trillion, which will bring the oil from Alaska, from the outer continental shelf, under proper environmental safeguards, convert coal and oil shale to oil, to develop solar energy and fusion and hydrogen and all the other alternatives, so that this nation will be fully independent, and never, never again be placed in a posture where they can be blackmailed by any Arab oil potentate anywhere in the world. And I'm talking about a program that will put millions of our people to work. Everything from the man at the bench in the shop, the blue-collar worker, to those of you who will be learning and are learning the new disciplines, whether they're in the sciences or in the engineering areas, here and as you leave here, where you'll be able to be employed because we are going to engage in the greatest program of expansion in our history. And I think we can properly refer to it as the Third Industrial Revolution. We want jobs, and we're going to get jobs for all of our people. And in that process, as we put our people back to work, and remember that when you reduce unemployment 1%, you pick up $16 billion in revenue at the federal level, not counting what you pick up at the state and local level. We're going to use that money to help get our cities back on their feet. Well, it's going to be done. Now, let me say a word about the cities. I was the first one to meet with your mayor and your governor early last summer to come out for help to New York City when the other politicians said it was unpopular and they wouldn't have anything to do with it. I took the lead. And I introduced legislation to provide for guaranteed loans on bonds in order to bring down the interest rate. You have no idea the cost for this city alone in interest that all of you are affected by it. This school is affected by it. It costs $1,800,000,000 just to pay the interest on municipal bonds. No, we're, I'm, I'm talking, you're not paying. No, 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 well, let me give you a little orientation about municipal bonds. They're tax exempt. The federal government doesn't get one dime of tax from a tax exempt municipal bond. The shareholder who holds them gets it. All I'm trying to say to you is that the city of New York, the citizens are paying out each year $1,800,000,000 in interest alone. And my program to guarantee those loans will bring those interest rates down 
by a half. Cut them in two so we can reduce the cost of the debt. We're paying out in this city alone one billion dollars in welfare. And I propose that the costs of welfare be assumed by the federal government because it is a national responsibility. Now these are concrete programs to help the city in the health area alone. The federal government is not paying that part of it. They should pay all of it. The city of New York is paying out over one billion dollars a year for health services of one kind or another. And I propose that the federal government assume that responsibility because it is a national responsibility. Three-fourths of all the people that are getting these benefits who come in here are citizens of the United States, but three-fourths of them were not born in the state of New York. And why should the state of New York bear the responsibilities of the costs of health, of welfare, and so on, of people who come in from another state where the benefits here are better and it's more attractive to come here, but you pay the bill. I say that's the national responsibility, and we ought to take it off the back of the people of this city. And that's true of other cities. Your colleges are having problems because of that welfare load, unfairly shared, because of that health load, because of that interest load. And I propose, as a number one reform, to really help our city with the revenues that we'll get from full employment, is to realign our responsibilities between the cities and the federal government. That is what is needed. The city is in trouble because the city is now, and that's you, all of you, are carrying a load that should be the load of the federal government and all citizens of the United States, and not just the people right here. That is the number one. And we're going to increase aid to education, primary and secondary, which will release funds for higher education from the current contribution of 7% to 33 and one-third percent. That will be done over a period of three to four years, and it will help our schools. And we're going forward with housing programs, and we want to make it possible for people to earn a living right in the inner city and not have to leave New York and go into the outer areas in order to make a living we want to rebuild, literally rebuild our cities by providing incentives and inducements for industry to locate here, light industry, compatible industry. They can make investments here, create jobs here, make our cities livable, have good housing, safe neighborhoods, good homes, and with all of this, we can do the things that we need to do to make America better, and that includes a national health insurance program that will cover all of our people. A national health insurance program, as I pointed out to you, will save the city of New York over a billion dollars a year in costs now being borne by the citizens of this particular city. And we can do this only with the program of full employment. And when our people are fully employed, we'll be adding $150 billion a year in revenue that'll make possible the things that I have just outlined to you. May I say above all else, we want a world of peace. We want a real detente and not a phony one. Obviously, we have had a phony detente when the President of the United States 
said the other day he's removing the word detente from his vocabulary. I think he learned something about what he has been reading in his speeches when he can understand it. Not sure that he always understands what he's reading. But isn't it a remarkable thing for the President of the United States going all over the country telling the people about the wonders of detente, and then all of a sudden he says, I'm removing it from my vocabulary. What he ought to do is remove it retroactively. So he could clean the slate all the way, starting with the Russian green robbery of 1972, when everyone got taken, and the consumer in particular, thanks to old Earl Butts, the Secretary of Agriculture, you paid a billion dollars more for food in nine months. And may I say, in a Jackson administration, we are going to utilize the enormous resources of our country. Food is one of them. The world would starve if it wasn't for the food of the United States that we export. I want to use our food, our science, our technology, our managerial know-how in some hard bargaining so that we can bring about a more peaceful world and so that when we sell something, we'll get something in return. There's nothing wrong with the idea and concept of detente. I support it. It means lessening of tension. What's wrong is the mismanagement of detente, the gross mismanagement of detente including the arms agreement giving the Russians the advantage, including the advantages they gave to the Soviet Union and the advantages they took in the Yom Kippur War, where they aided and abetted and carried on and assisted in that conflict against the tiny state of Israel. After promising only three months before that detente would avoid such a thing, but they were not only satis not satisfied with sending the arms, including nuclear arms, to Egypt, but they called on the Arab oil countries to put on the embargo and to raise the price of oil up and up and up. And I say, when they want to do a thing like that, food power is more important than oil power, and we shouldn't hesitate to use it. I led the fight three years ago to roll back the price of oil on our domestically produced oil. Why in the world should the price of oil produced here in the United States of America be set at the price fixed by the oil sheets? Nixon vetoed that bill. We didn't have enough votes to override. We finally were able, after three overrides this past year under Ford and after he lost the election to a Democratic senator in New Hampshire, and the issue was the price of oil. We got him to sign my bill that rolled it back three cents a gallon. And if he hadn't signed that bill, if he'd vetoed it, you'd be paying a dollar a gallon for gasoline. And if you think your electric bill is high now and your heating bill is high now, it would have gone through the roof. And I want to say that when I become president, we're going to roll those prices back further to help the consumer of America who's been getting hit over and over again. And I want to use our bargaining power. I want to use our bargaining power to reduce arms on both sides. Both sides. Soviet Union and the United States have more nuclear arms, more conventional arms than they need, but we will call upon them to join in a mutual balanced reduction on the basis of parity and equality. If they'll do that, we're willing to help. And if they'll join with us in making it possible for people who wish to leave a country freely as provided by international law, that they may do so. 
I was very proud walking up here, a young man who's a student here that I helped get out of Russia. Where is he? Hold up his hand. Right down here. I'm very proud. I'm very proud if it's only one person. The good book reminds us if you've helped to save one life, you've helped to save the world. And let us not forget that fact. This is a time for brave and courageous men and women. And I want to say that the whole world owes a debt of gratitude to Dr. Andrei Sakharov staying behind as he as he is at the moment in the Soviet Union to help others leave that country. And here is a man who's, who is standing up. Here's a man, well, human liberty and human freedom is everyone's business. And make no mistake about that. Human freedom and human liberty is everyone's business. And I want to say the whole world owes a debt of gratitude to Dr. Andrei Sakharov, one man against 240 million, and he's took them all on, and he's helped get people out from behind the Iron Curtain. And we must stand up for international law and do everything in our power to encourage and make possible those who want to leave a country freely may do so as provided by international law. We need a foreign policy with some idealism. Finally, I want to say to you that I offer not a lesser America, as some are talking. They say we've got to cut back, we've got to do this. But what about the people that are still in the ghetto? I say we need a greater America, not a lesser America. We need to have economic growth with quality life, and we can have both. But without that economic growth, we cannot provide the job. We cannot build a home. We cannot build a safe neighborhood to end crime. We cannot do all these things that we must do in order to have quality life in America. I, well, let me, let me just, let me just finish my remarks. I pointed out to those who listen carefully that for every 1% you remove from the unemployment rolls, you pick up $16 billion. And with full employment, we'll have $160 billion of revenue that we don't have now. And the centerpiece of a Jackson administration will be full employment. That's where we're going to get the money. That's where the revenues are. And that is the way we're going to build a better America. And I'm very proud not only build a better America, but we're going on to build a safer environment in the world for the cause of peace. I can't help but be reminded of the words of that great American poet, Archibald MacLeish, who said it so well. Well, if you haven't heard of him, uh, I'll have to give you an F in your English course. His words are wise ones, and they're as follows. The American journey has not ended. America is never accomplished. America is always still to build. I ask you on this sunny afternoon to join with me in the great crusade to help build a greater and a better America and may I say, a safer world for all mankind, where we'll have an environment of peace. I ask not that you simply ask for a greater America, 
because there's something more important than that. I do not want simply to make America great again. I want, in the light of Watergate and all that's happened, I want to make America good again. I believe, I believe that in the last analysis, our greatness will be found in our goodness. And I want you to join me in this crusade. You have an opportunity on April 6th to vote for my delegates, to join in that grand coalition that we forged in Massachusetts, where we brought together working men and women, where we brought together business, the professions, where we brought together all nationality and ethnic groups and all religious groups in one grand coalition. I want you to join with me between now and April 6th to forge that grand coalition started in this state by one of the great presidents of all times, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, when he forged the New Deal. And we're going to forge a better deal for all Americans without regard to race, creed, or color, or station in life. Join me in that crusade, and it will be a better America and a safer world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jackson. Thank you, Senator. Your message is well received. We accept your platform. We wish you success. And we hope that come April 6th, you will be the nominee of the New York primaries. Thank you very, very much. And thank you all for coming here and listening to the Senator. And I hope you turn out on April 6th to vote for your favorite candidate. And we hope that your favorite candidate is going to be the Senator. Progressive, a word Webster describes as moving ahead. The way WKCC describes it is a lot different. Exploring new horizons in music, the new experience is on 590 AM in New York. Progressive Radio is back. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Senator Jackson. Very well, might be your next president. Mike Rapp, let's take you into the sounds of Sam Sam. <laughs> <laughs> 